A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, I say to you, it will be hard for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For men this is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Then Peter said to him in reply, We have given up everything and followed you. What will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, that you, will have, that you who have followed me in the new age, when the Son of Man is seated on his throne of glory, will yourselves sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my sake, uh, for the sake of my name, will receive a hundred times more, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I hope you're all bright-eyed at this uh, ungodly hour of the morning to be talking and listening. So we begin in, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We might begin with our prayer to St. Monica. I think in bringing to mind all those who uh, we wish the Lord to give the gift of faith to, especially in our own families and among uh, maybe spouses as well and friends. Saint Monica, troubled wife and mother, many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired or lost faith. With confidence, persistence and profound faith, you prayed daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord. Intercede for me, dear Saint Monica, for these people. And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. There's a book in the Old Testament and it's called The Song of Songs and maybe you've read it now and again. I like to read it when I'm feeling the blues because it's quite funny and it's unusual because it's a love song and that's uh, very unusual in the Old Testament. And it's not a very successful love song if a young man is trying to woo his, his bride because it's got some wonderful lines like this. He says to her, Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one of them is bereaved. So that is not the line that's going to save a failing relationship. Though she might be glad to know at least that her teeth are washed whatever about looking like sheep. But it's strange because it, this love song is about God speaking to Israel and Israel speaking to God, and then, of course, to speak about sheep and things like that is, makes perfect sense. And the bride and groom in the Song of Songs, they sing songs to each other. And at one point, Israel, the bride, says to us, the readers, Upon my bed by night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. I will rise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. The watchman found me as they went about in the city. Scarcely had I passed them, when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go. When Jesus rose from, dead, from the dead on Easter Sunday, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And St. John the Evangelist, when he tells this story in his own way, he constructs the story to resemble the Song of Songs. 
that this meeting of the risen Christ and Mary Magdalene is the meeting of the lover and the bride in the Song of Songs. So Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb when it's still dark. She can't find the Lord, him whom my soul loves. She runs and gets Peter and John and then sees two angels in the tomb, one at Jesus's, where, where Jesus' feet were and one where his head were, as if they're watching. And scarcely has she passed them, scarcely has she seen them, than she turns and she sees Jesus himself. And of course, as you know yourselves, she falls down at his feet and will not let him go. She thinks also he's the gardener. And in the Song of Songs, the bride says to her lover, O you who dwell in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. So John the Evangelist gives us this, this twist on the story of the resurrection, that the, the resurrection story is a love song, like the Song of Songs. And what's he trying to say to us by means of, of doing that? He's trying to say to us that Jesus rose from the dead as the lover of our souls. Of course, he died on the cross too, as the lover of our souls. And he rose from the dead, not simply thinking about himself and his victory, but as the lover of our souls. And it's true to say our souls, because the bride in this Song of Songs is, first of all, Israel in the Old Testament, is transformed into the church in the New Testament, but also for each of us individually, us. So Jesus rises from the dead as the lover of our souls. I once met a woman, an artist, who lived up in the, the northwest of Ireland, and she is a minister of the Eucharist in one of our Dominican churches there. And I never asked her, but she was very happy to volunteer her own story. And she said that she had been born into a very difficult family with no religion. At the age of 18, she went to a third level college, if you know what that is. No, did you have the same terminology here? Not quite a university, but to study art. And after a year there, she found herself very depressed and she decided to end her life. But before she did herself in, she said to herself that she was going to take one last visit to the place that she most loved, which was the side of a mountain looking over the Atlantic Ocean. And so she went there and she climbed the gate and went into a field and she sat in the field. And as she sat in the field with her hand on the ground, an ant walked over her, her hand and she just brushed it off. And then another ant walked over her hand and she brushed it off. And she started to become aware that there were quite a few insects around the field. And in fact, the whole field was buzzing with life, with flowers and, and with um, bees going from one flower to the other and butterflies. And she said she was very struck by, whole, by how the, the whole field was, was full of life. And she said, and I felt so dead inside myself. So that moment she made up her mind that she wasn't going to end her life but she was going to find what was the source of this life, this wonderful life that was buzzing around her. And she eventually found it in the Eucharist, in the bread of life. Whatever experience she had, I never found out, but uh, she found the source of life in the Eucharist. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. It's good for us to remember that to come to know the Lord Jesus is the greatest gift we can receive. There is nothing like it in our lives. So we might have a wonderful spouse, but to know the Lord and to love your spouse in the Lord is a still more wonderful thing. We might have wonderful friends, wonderful family, wonderful life, but to have all these things in the Lord Jesus is really what, what makes everything approach perfection. The Lord is the savior of the world. And he's not only the savior of the world in terms of his death and resurrection 2000 years ago, which we all know about and profess our faith in, but he's the savior of the world right here and now. He's the savior of the world for that lady who felt completely dead inside herself. But when she found him, she found life. And I know numerous people and I've, I've had suicides in, in my own family too. And I know numerous people who've been saved from suicide because they have met the Lord and they have gone through life. Um, and I, I just wish that 
you know, those in, in my family who've been affected by suicide would know the Lord too and what a difference it could have made. When St. Augustine had been converted, he and St. Monica decided to go home to Africa and they were at the port waiting for their ship. And his conversion and her gratefulness, his gratefulness for her prayers and her joy at his conversion and his joy at his conversion had brought them very close. They're more soulmates now than, than mother and soul. And Augustine writes these words. He says, as they were waiting at the port there in Ostia, just outside Rome to take ship, he said, there we talked together, she and I alone, in deep joy, and forgetting the things that were behind and looking forward to those that were before, we were discussing what the eternal life of the saints could be like, which I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man. And she said to him in her turn that now she didn't really want to live anymore. She felt that her whole life had been complete and that she got everything out of it that she really wanted because she got her greatest joy, which was to see her son as a Catholic Christian. And St. Monica reminds us, I think, that there's nothing greater in life than to know Christ. Often we, we say to ourselves and we say to our friends and we hear everywhere that it doesn't really matter what religion you are. My friends, it does. It does. There is no one like Jesus in the history of the world. And what a great gift we have here sitting in this church that we know him. We might know, not know him very well. We might not know him as well as we should, but we know him a little bit. And that is the greatest gift which we could receive. And as well, the greatest gift that we could hope for other people too. Because God is like a tree, not in every way, but just in this way. But God is like a tree and we are like the fruit. And for a man or a woman to grow to who they should be without God is like an apple trying to grow without the tree. Or Jesus uses a different image that you'll be very used to. We are, he is the vine and we are the branches. And um, he says, I am the vine, you, you are the branches. He who remains in me and I in him, he it is that bears fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So in Dublin, my job is director of priestly formation. So we have our student house there and uh, I have, I'm responsible for certain areas of it. And it goes without saying that some of our students for the priesthood, our Dominicans, are adult converts to the faith. that They lost the faith and came back to it. And one day I asked them what it means in their opinion to say that we've been reading that Christ renews our mind. And I said, what, the, what do you think that means? And one of them said, you know, when you come to faith, all the things that used to attract you, they change. And all of a sudden you love other things. You love things that uh, you really are going to love for the rest of your life. And another said that even waking up in the morning and hearing the birds singing in the trees is a different experience when you have Christ in your life. And once upon a time as well, I was living for a few years with the Dominicans in England. And one afternoon, one of the brothers came back from a walk around the town and he called into an Anglican church or what you call an Episcopalian church nearby. And there was a volunteer in it, a lady who uh, she was a volunteer in that church. She sung in the choir in that church, but she was in fact Catholic. And she said that she'd become a Catholic because she worked in a home for the dying in a hospice for palliative care. And she used to notice in this hospice palliative care. Who do you think were the ones who died with most peace and most hope in their lives? It was the Catholics. So she said to herself, I want that. And so she became a Catholic too. So all of us have received a great, great gift by our faith to know that Christ is the lover of our souls, who's walking with us right through life into eternity, giving us all these gifts the Eucharist and forgiveness and his teaching and all the other sacraments step by step through life into eternity as the lover of our souls. And St. Monica would have appreciated well. We call Jesus our savior and we mean it. So uh, let's turn again anew today to the lover of our souls and let's bring all those who we love most of all for that greatest gift of all, 
that those whom we love most of all might be most happy in this world and in the next through faith in Christ. Before we finish, we'll just say our prayer to St. Jude as well. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the Church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, and particularly this request. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron, and encourage devotion to you. Saint Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. We wish you a lovely day and uh, all the joy of the Lord with you this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.